this class is uh, going to be a lot less difficult than last week. So last week we did theory, theory, theory. Uh, it was a bit overwhelming, and in hindsight, I probably won't do it again. <laughs> Thinking back about it, I'll probably, um, in the future, if I teach this course, I just cover lightly eigenvalues, but not go through the derivation. So from a graduate student perspective, I mean, I'm, I was having this debate in my mind, should I, shouldn't I have it? At the end of the day, this is a 700 level course, right? I'm not teaching this course to people in companies. When I teach this course to companies, we don't cover the details like eigenvector. And in fact, we don't even go through the details algorithm too much. But you guys are all grad students, very mathematically inclined. Um, that is why you're doing masters and PhD uh, studies after all. So one mind, in one mind I feel, okay, it's not that necessary to go through all the details, but on the other hand, I feel it is because um, you get a really deep understanding of what the algorithm is doing if you understand the argument of decomposition or if you understand the details. But of those two, I would say understanding what details is doing is far more important than understanding the argument of decomposition. So uh, going forward, if you, if you want to review anything in the notes, I would strongly focus on the new health section again, if that's, if that's something you didn't quite get the first time around. Uh, but in today's class, we're going to cover several statistical topics today. Um, one is, how do we use a PCA model after we've, we've built it? Right? So we, we don't just build these models for one source and to take a look at them, we want to reuse them in the future. So at the start here, I'll cover a bit how we do that. Uh, that's important because it, we require that by the end of the class when we look at process monitoring. But in order to get to this step here at the end, what we need to look at is what is this concept of overfitting? This is a general statistical concept. It doesn't just apply to multivariate models. You can overfit a least squares model. Um, you can overfit a neural network model, you can overfit any sort of mathematical model. The reason why we need to understand what overfitting is and, and what it's doing is we want to ultimately answer this question that from the very first class people have been asking how many components should we use. We've always used the autofit function in the software, um, but really how do we know what that autofit procedure is doing and should we trust it? What are, so there's some issues around that that I want to look at here when we look at this issue of number of components. Also, as you've used the software, you may have noticed that there's certain limits drawn on the plots. So the T1, T2 plot has this ellipse on it. And if you look at this PE, there's a 95 and a 99% confidence in <laughs> So I'm going to look at how those limits are derived. And then finally, we use all of this knowledge that we've looked at here in the first part of today's class to understand what process monitoring is about. And those of you who've taken 4C3 um, here at Mac, or those of you who, who know what process monitoring is or seen process monitoring charts, we'll first recap what the basics are of process monitoring. We'll look at the shortcomings of that and then understand how latent variable methods really help address all those shortcomings from conventional multivariate, uh, from conventional monitoring charts. Okay, so that's where we're heading today. But before I um, keep going, I just want to quickly address this question. I've had some emails from Jan Serbrak was asking about this earlier. They noticed when you were doing your assignment too that you sometimes get answers that are flipped in sign from the software. Who noticed that? Did anyone else get their loadings different in sign from the software? You got so the reason why that isn't a big deal is because we can write our PCA model, remember x hat is TP transpose, we can just flip the signs internally. Okay, so as long as both the scores and, and the loadings are flipped in sign, you still get the same x hat. Okay? And you'll then, by, by extension, the next step after you've got x hat is to get your residuals. So x is x hat plus residuals. So our x is the data we measure x hat is equal to tp transpose but we can also write that as minus t minus p transpose plus or you can even flip the signs only of certain columns in t and p okay and you'll still get a consistent model so sign flipping is not a big deal 
Don't be worried about it. Um, in fact, you can take your own code, if those of you who've written your own code, you transport it to someone else's computer. Your own, same code will give us, will give us some application. Okay, so it's quite normal. The interpretation of the model doesn't change. The interpretation is still consistent. And the predictions from the model, via x hat, which is equal to tp transpose, they're still the same. Okay, so don't be don't be surprised by, by that issue. Uh, and, the, and geometrically, you can understand it as follows: when we when we derive the PCA from this illustration, I arbitrarily assign that direction to be the positive direction, and that direction to be the negative direction. And I said, let's say, take this point over here, and I project it onto that first loading. That distance from the origin is a positive distance, and these distances when projected are negative. But there's no reason why I can just flip that 180 degrees around and, form, and let me call this side the negative side and have the positive side. Nothing changes. Okay? It's just by convention that one direction is being chosen over another. Okay. Further questions? Let's talk about using a PCA model on new data in the future. This part above the dashed line is what you've done up to now in this course. We've spent a few, a few classes looking at decomposing matrix X into its loadings P and into the scores T. And once we've calculated the T and P matrix, we can calculate X hat. And once we've got X hat, we can calculate the residuals by subtraction from X, from X hat. So X hat represents the projection onto the plane of X. The error matrix E represents the, the distance off the plane. Um, well, sorry, the errors represent the residuals, and then we take those residuals, remember, and within each row in the residual matrix, we calculate the sum of squares, which is EI transpose EI, and that's equal to the square prediction error. So within a row, we can calculate SPE for the i row. That's simply the distance off the plane from the projection. So that's when we build the model. Now the question we're asking is, in the future, I want to bring in a new vector x. And I want to calculate that vector x scores and that new points SPE values. Okay, how do I do that? And the reason why we're looking at this is because we're going to want to use this model in the future for monitoring our process or for understanding what's going on here. But we, we, when we build this model, we don't have this vector available. X nu becomes available in the future after we've built the model. We'd like to see does X, where does X nu fall on the T1, T2, or T1, T3 score plot? Does X nu fall on the model plane or off the model plane? So how can we calculate the new score values as well as the new SPE value for that observation? Okay. We'll just do it for one observation because if we can do it for one row, we can just repeat this process for many rows. So I will just look at one, one row for now. And I'm going to ask you how to do it. Okay. It's not really hard. Think of the Dipels algorithm. When you did the Dipels algorithm, how did we calculate in those iterations, how do we calculate the scores, T? Placing the observation onto the LTV. Okay, so you're all saying that when we, we, we did it, we regressed the observation onto the, lo onto the loading vector, P. Okay, that's exactly what we're going to do here for X nu. Remember, we've got our model of now. In this model building phase, we've got our P matrix, we've got our T matrix. So we can take our new observation and simply regress it onto the loading vector for P1. And that gives us our T1 value for that new observation. So let's, let's write out the steps over here. So I'm going to, I, I actually left out a little step here prior to this. So step one is, let's call this X nu comma raw. So this is the raw data that you measure now in the future. We first have to pre-process that data, right? How do we do that? Harry? Centering. Centering and scaling, great. So minus a centering 
vector. vector. Which centering vector do we use? So when we built our model originally, we have to also store somewhere that centering vector and that scaling vector that we used when we built that model. Okay. So we subtract from that x mean, I'll put you a common train, to indicate that that's the, the mean vector from when we trained the model, or built the model, or from the model building phase. And we divide through by x scale as well from the training data. Okay. That's equal to x mu. So this x mu over here is not the raw data. It's the centered and scaled data using the centering and scaling when we built the model originally. Is that clear? Now, Joel said we regress that vector x mu onto the loading vector p1. Let's just deal with the first component and then we'll go to the next component after. So when he says that, what he means is he's saying take t1 nu is going to be our regression coefficient, and we regress x nu onto p1 divided by p1 transpose p1. So that's just the equation x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Here's your x transpose x inverse, the denominator of, the, of that is your um, inverse plot x transpose y, because you're regressing this vector onto your, your loading, p1. And you're going to get that regression coefficient t1 new. Same, same step as from the default algorithm. Now we've got our t1 new. What can we do with t1? New. X hat new. Okay, so then we calculate x hat new comma one. I'll indicate that because we're going to use one component to calculate x hat <coughs> is equal to hat. P1 nu times P1 transpose. Okay. So what we've done here, x nu 1 represents the point on the model plane for that new data point. x nu represents the point inside the cloud, so we're not necessarily on the model plane. x1 hat, though, is the point on the model plane. And once we have the point on the model plane, we can then obviously calculate the distance of the model. So that's E, E, comma 1 is equal to X, X U minus X hat mu. Second component, how do we calculate that? Uh, so if we want to add, calculate the second small value for, for the new vector. Jake is just trying to answer. Yeah. Uh, I would, I guess, get subtract the x hat from the x here, x and minus x minus well, x. Same process as in the Nikels algorithm, right? So we, we deflate the part that we've just predicted and then calculate the second component. So the next step is, Calculate uh, uh, six, several steps here. This would be three, four. The fifth step then is to deflate, which says we're going to let x add u. Sorry, x u equals x u minus t one u p one transpose or basically x minus x hat. And then we're going to calculate the second com component by, by regressing this x new vector onto the p2. Say t, t2 new is equal to x new times p2 divided by 
the bar. And we proceed into a team. The end of the Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is just using the new vector. We're just dealing yeah, on, on a single vector. Yeah, I should write this is a lowercase case. Residual vector when we've only fit one component. Okay. After add, calculating the second component, we can calculate e2 u or e u2. So that's the vector now after calculating two components, which is equal to in the same way x nu minus <coughs> e2 minus p2. So every time this residual should decrease, that residual vector should get smaller, and SPP then is calculated as the sum of squares inside that vector. <coughs> so nothing, nothing changes from the normal algorithm. We're really just repeating on one row now what we did previously when we built the model. That, that's going to, that to me is the most important thing you should take away from this. We're not doing anything new here. We're just dealing with x nu in the same way as we dealt with the x data in the new cells algorithm. In fact, after you've built your model, one good way to test your model is to just go take an arbitrary row from x and do all these steps that I just described. And you should get exactly the same t1, t2, t3, Etc. values as when you calculated them up here. And you should get the same SPE value as well. So that's a good way to check your model afterwards, to check your calculations. You can, of course, do all these calculations in one go. Um, so here I've got a slide. You just convert your x, u, uh, x raw data to x u. This isn't in your notes. This is, uh, I just added this in. You can calculate t nu in one go, in fact, by just multiplying x nu by p. Once you get t hat t nu, you calculate x hat by saying t p transpose. Calculate the residuals in the usual way by saying x minus x hat. And then calculate x s p e by saying the sum of squares. So there's nothing, nothing particularly new here that we've learned, other than we're just applying the same technique on the new algorithm on a new vector. And that's again emphasizes the importance of understanding that last section in the previous class on the new algorithm. Okay, before I move on to discussing overfitting, is there any any doubts or questions here on this particular? So let's take a look at overfitting. Overfitting, you, you probably heard, who's, you've heard the term before, I'm sure, right? It's, it's not a new, a new concept, but I would like to just uh, make sure that everyone is, is on the same level. And the example I'm going to use here is a very simple example. It actually comes from these squares. But the concepts from this example hold in general for PCA and PLS models. So I will choose to explain it using a very simplified explanation here, but all the concepts will hold for you in the future. So here's the problem. We've got two vectors, x and y. Okay? Two columns of data, x and y. And five data points. And I've plotted these as a scatter plot. And we're asking the question, what is the relationship here between x and y? Can I build a model to describe the relationship between x and y? And if I did build a model, what would that model look like? What form would be that model? Okay. So, Brandon, what would you say that relationship is between x and y? It's probably linear, but it could be quadratic. Okay, it looks linear and simple, right? You can easily predict. Yeah. Okay. 
exactly right. So you could you start off like with the linear model would be a good assumption. You could then increase your complexity by adding a quadratic term. You could then say, well, why stop there? Let's add a cubic term and keep going and make your model as complex as you like. You could also look at fitting uh, logs of x versus y, or log of y versus x. All of those, those trials, every time you build one of those models, you're adding some more complexity there to it. Okay, so let's just take a look at one of the most basic models you could fit. Um, the first one is what I call no model. You could just fit a horizontal line to the data, which is just the mean of the y values. Okay? And actually, don't, be, don't I see a few of you are smiling, but it's not funny in, in the sense that I see this all the time. Sometimes people just have a whole cluster of data. The best prediction you can make for that data set is the mean of it. Okay? But in this case, that mean Clearly there's some residual distance here from every data point to that line that we're not accounting for. Okay? So in this particular instance, a horizontal line or a, 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 an intercept is really not good enough. Okay? So we proved that particular model out. So we're saying y is equal to b0. That's the case of no model. Really, it is actually a model. It's a model with one parameter, the intercept. If I fit that model, the residuals in that model are large. Okay? So yi, ei, my yi values here on the y-axis, the residuals then represent the distance from that point b0, which is this black line. Those residual errors are really large. Okay? And if I calculated e1 squared plus e2 squared, and so on up to e5 squared, that represents the sum of squares of those residuals, so in other words, the total length, that length plus that length plus that length, those five lengths, I would get some number over here, some large, large quantity. So then I can say, well, I'm going to try and fit instead yi is equal to b0 plus b1xi plus some residuals. I'm adding a second term to my model. I'm going from here to here. I'm in increasing the complexity of my model by adding one extra parameter. So here, I've got two parameters now to estimate, because previously I just had one parameter to estimate. So increase complexity, calculate the sum of squares of those residuals, gives me some number. From that, I can calculate r squared, which in this case is 90.8%. Let's go add a, a, a quadratic term. So yi is equal to b0 plus b1 x1 xi plus b2 xi squared. This is still a least squares model. Okay, because I'm estimating parameters b0, b1, and b2, which are linear. I just take an intercept in my column of x and my column of x squared, form x matrix, calculate y is equal to x transpose x inverse, x transpose y, and the output from that matrix multiplication is a 3 by 1 vector containing my b0, b1, and b2 parameters. So this is a least squares model still, but I've increased the complexity of that least squares model by adding the three terms to it. And R squared goes up, as it should. R squared must go up. Every time you add a new term to your linear model, it has to go up. R squared will never, ever decrease when you add a new term. Why is that? Right? You know? The error is reduced, you're right, because maybe not for the reason you said, but the reason is the error is reduced because that is the objective function of these squares, is to minimize the sum of squares of the error. So every time you add a new term, it gives it the ability to reduce the errors from the previous term. R squares error will never go up. Well, e, the 
sorry, the sum of squares of the errors will never go up, which means R squared will go up. Sorry, I said that totally wrong. This will, this will always get smaller, which means R squared will always get bigger. And that would be a clearer way of saying Okay. I could then obviously add a cubic term, and as you see in your notes there, R squared goes up again by quite a bit this time. And then finally, I could fit a quartic model, which has five parameters and five unknowns, so I fit that red line goes exactly through every one of my data points, and I get my I squared will be identically zero for that final case in the quartic model. Okay. Now, which model is correct? Good. It's exactly right. The problem here is at some point we've overfit. Okay, we, we know that we've overfitted here. But the key to discussing overfitting is, as Jake said, you have to, it depends on what you're going to use your model for. How you're going to use that model in the future is the way you're going to determine that you've overfitted. So let's take a look. If, if you were to describe this relationship to your colleague, Landon said that he would say maybe it's linear initially, is what you, you started you would start off with. That would be a good way to describe this relationship. It's a linear relationship. It's unlikely you would want to describe this relationship as quadratic. It's it's just adding extra complexity to your to a, 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 an informal discussion you would have with someone else. But if your objective was to make predictions of y given a new x, in other words, you want to work this way. Given a new x value, you want to make a prediction of what y would be in the future. Would you use a linear model, a quadratic model, a cubic model? I wonder where we are. Are we in a space that we fit, or are we in a space that is inside of where we fit? OK, let's take this particular data set, and uh, here's all the five, uh, sorry, the yeah, five models we fit. You said it depends. So where would you, where would you stop in this particular case? I would think the purple's probably pretty decent. Purple's a decent fit. Yeah. Everyone agree with that? For a predictive point of view, to to predict a new y given an x, the purple line seems good enough. Anyone choose a different line? Quartic. You'd go with the quartic line. Yeah. Because that that does describe the data. The best describes that data set. Yeah. Okay. The prediction will be pretty accurate in that case. So anyone would argue for cubic? I would just say linear. The linear yeah. one? So with anyone, the... anyone, anyone of them is good. Okay. So <laughs> you, I mean, that, the, this is exactly the problem with determining the number of components in a PCA model. There is no correct answer. Uh, you can argue it from so many different angles. And depending on your usage case, one component, two components, or in this particular instance, one parameter, two parameters, three parameters, might be might might suit your needs. And that's the point I want to get across. Uh, the other final case I had over here was was quite interesting. If you want to make predictions of x for a desired y, let's say someone comes to you and says, uh, let's say the relationship further in, between x and y is such that y is the, the the output of your process in X is a key input variable. Now someone comes to sit and says, I want a product with this particular property Y. Can you make it for me? You say, sure I can. Let me go calculate what settings I need to use in my process, the X. Okay, so now you're, now you're uh, what we're calling inverting the model. You're running the model backwards. For a given Y, you go back and you calculate what your X might be. Which model would you use in that case? Why wouldn't you use the cubic? Sorry. Oh no, it exists already, and we've got lots of computing power. So how would 
why wouldn't you use the cubic connection of the spins? Or David, why the whole bunch of different? Right. It's, 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 it's this undefined relationship when you go backwards. You, if let's say someone wants a property at, at, at nine on the y-axis, you can have multiple values of x that give you that y. Okay. So you get two solutions in that particular instance. It it may not be a set. It may be right. Like let's. We don't know. Let's say the true process underlying the system really is cubic, then that would be a perfectly correct way of, of figuring it out. We don't know what the true relationship is between these two variables. Um, and I would then argue for, if we didn't know the true relationship, in that case, a linear quadratic, as Libby, as Libby said originally, would be a suitable way of inverting the model. So what I, what I'm trying to get across here is that depending on how you use the model really answers your question of when am I overfitting? So in certain cases, like let's say you want to do really good predictions, it might not be too bad to go add extra terms. But in, in other cases, like when you're inverting the model, actually having fewer terms might give you a more stable solution. So overfitting is totally dependent on how you want to use the model in the future. And here's another, just to make it even more messy and have this discussion uh, growing in your brain, I want you to think of this case. This data I took from exactly the same system. So let me just quickly step back. When I generated this data set, I, I put in an arbitrary function into R with some random noise. And it, the first data set it generated for me was these five data points are shown there. Then I change the random number generator and re-requested re, uh, re the data. So this would be the equivalent of you going into the lab and repeating your experiment, again, on the same system. But when you repeat your experiment, you get different error on it. It's still the same system. Nothing has changed underneath. Only the random error that you got from the process. So in this particular example, I got these five data points. And now the linear cubic and the quadratic model all perform rel relatively the same over that range of data. So there's no right answer to how many components I should use or equivalently how complex should I make my model. Because it, it totally depends on the data set you have in front of you at that time. And if you've got a limited data set, you can get an answer like this. Or if you repeat your data set, you can get a, a, a different answer like that, okay? From the same system. So in this particular case, I would argue that having the cubic would be an overfit. I probably started overfitting the moment I started going from quadratic to cubic in this particular case, from a predictive point. In this particular data set, from the same system, cubic probably isn't that much of an overfit over this range. Cubic would definitely be an overfit the moment I started to go beyond cubic. You can see that this guy's starting to turn up and if you're extrapolating, you're likely going to make a mistake. But over this range, all three models perform roughly the same. So the key way to avoid overfitting is as follows. When we get a data set, always keep some of it aside. And the general rule of thumb is 50% would be ideal. If you can't, if you don't have that many roads, at least keep 25% of the roads aside for testing. Build your model. Actually, so there's a, there's a point missing there. The next, the next one is build your, your model. Then you go ahead and you use that model to predict values from the testing case. So in this case, these x's and these y's are from the testing data. So xi, xi over here, that's from the testing data set. And I predict my y. I calculate my residuals. Okay, so I've just calculated y hat over here. Yi is from my testing data set that I kept aside. I know what y was. Calculate the residuals. Calculate the sum of squares of those residuals. And I'll call that quantity the prediction error sum of squares. So press. So press. It is calculated on testing data, on data that was not used to build the model. Okay. We'll often call RSS the residual sum of squares. That's the residual sum of squares from 
the data that you use to build your model. Press, we call the residual sum of squares from totally new data that was kept aside. So when you built your model, and you calculated V0, V1, V2 in this case, those parameters were calculated from the training data. The testing data were kept aside. So these three values were not influenced by the testing data. Now we go bring our testing data in, calculate Y hat, calculate our residuals, calculate the prediction error sum of squares, which we call press. Okay. So residual sum of squares is for from building the model and prediction error sum of squares from testing. So in this particular case, what I've gone and done, the open circles represent the model that I had originally. And I've kept aside these four squares as testing data. So four data points I kept aside as testing data that I didn't show you originally. And now I can go use them in those five models I built. The case of, the, of the, just a pure horizontal line, a linear model, quadratic model, and I've calculated the press on those four data points, remember? The press is for the prediction data. I've gone and calculated the press for those five models. What do you notice about them? Quadratic has the lowest press, lowest prediction error. And then something interesting happens. We, 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 get, we decrease and then we go back up again. So the prediction error gets worse and worse for a really overfitted model. And that makes, that makes sense, right? Because if you go look back at your cortex model, that red line, it's going all over like this. And that testing data point, that first one, was roughly over here, right? So the prediction error is that huge distance. In the second one, I forget where it was. But basically, the, because of this oscillation in the cortex model that's trying to fix the data, the prediction error on the testing data is really, really large, 29 units. And we see this in general. So the general principle to bear in mind for overfitting is as follows. <coughs> this concept holds as a generalization. Don't expect it to work as smoothly as I'm going to draw it here, but in practice, we say as complexity increases, what happens to my residual sum of squares? If I to plot my residual sum of squares as against this general direction of increasing complexity, it should get small. Okay. Tend to zero. As you make your model more and more complex by adding additional terms, your error, your RSS, will decrease. Your residual sum of squares will decrease. In other words, um, you can say, so this is, let's say that's equal to sum of squares of your errors. In other words, your R squared will go up and up and stabilize up to one. If I do plot R squared on here, we do exactly the mirror image of this. We just go up. Steady up, one. We level out at roughly one. What would happen to your prediction error sum of squares? Go down and back up again. Okay, so so trace will do the following and we'll do this and go up to some larger size. Where do you stop fitting complexity to your model? Where do you, where do you end? 
is here. So somewhere in this zone, you would stop adding components or you would stop adding terms to your little least squared model. So this optimum, that optimum, I mean, here we know that complexity isn't a, a smoothly changing curve like this, right? Because I've, I've only got discrete decisions. I'm adding one term, two terms, three terms. I can't add one and a half terms to my model. So this, this in reality for real data is, is, is a very broken sort of curve. And the, the reality is also that this optimum is usually quite flat. You can, you can often argue, well, I should use two components or three components, or I should use three terms or four terms in my liquid model. So even from a plot like this, there's no correct answer. So that's a general concept I want you to have in mind for um, when we come back after the break, then uh, we'll talk about um, for PCA, how we apply this concept we just looked at for PCA.